When I was a teenager, I'd gone to my doctor and I'd explained that I had this feeling like pain was leaking out of me and I couldn't control it, I couldn't regulate it, I felt quite ashamed of it. And my doctor told me a story that I now realise was really oversimplified. My doctor said, we know why people feel this way, scientists have proved it. There's a chemical called serotonin in people's brains. It makes them feel good. Uh, some people are naturally lacking it or have an imbalance in it. Obviously, you're one of them. All we need to do is give you these drugs, you're going to be fine. So I started taking an antidepressant called Siroxat, which, and I got quite a lot of relief um, initially. For a couple of months, I felt a lot better, quite a big boost. And then this feeling of pain started to come back. So I went back to my doctor. He said, clearly, I didn't give you a high enough dose. He gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. Again, this feeling of pain came back and I was really in that cycle of taking the drug, taking a higher dose, feeling a bit better and, it, and so on. Until for 13 years, I was taking the maximum possible dose you're allowed to take. At the end of which, I still felt like shit and I was experiencing all sorts of horrible side effects, huge weight gain, all sorts of problems. And I wanted to understand, well, what's going on here? Because I'm doing everything that I'm being told to do and I'm still in a lot of pain. And there seems to be something going wrong in, all around me in the wider culture, what's going on here? Can it really be that there's just some malfunction in everyone's brains at the same time? So I decided to go on a long journey to try to find the answer to these mysteries. So I ended up traveling over 40,000 miles. I went to interview the leading experts in the world about what causes depression and anxiety and what solves them. And just people have very different perspectives from an Amish village in Indiana, because the Amish have very low levels of depression, to a city in Brazil where they banned advertising to see if that would make people feel better, to a university in the United States where they were giving people magic mushrooms to see if that would help, ask me later. Uh, <laughs> and I learned lots of things, but to me, the heart of it is, I realized, until I went to my doctor when I was a teenager, I thought my depression was all in my head, meaning, you know, I was just being weak, I needed to man up. And then for the next 13 years, I thought my depression was all in my head, meaning it was just a chemical imbalance in my brain. But what I learned is there's scientific evidence for nine different causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them are indeed biological. Your genes can make you more sensitive to these problems. And there are real brain changes that begin when you become depressed that can make it harder to get out. But most of the causes, seven of them, they're not in our heads. They're factors in the way we're living. And that opens up a very different way of understanding why we feel like this and how we can find our way out. Everyone in this room knows, you guys all know, that you've got natural physical needs, obviously. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took any of them away from you, you'd be in a lot of trouble really quickly, right? There's equally strong evidence that human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. Our culture is good at lots of things. I'm glad to be alive today. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for people. And it's not the only thing that's going on by any means, but I think it's the key reason why this crisis is rising and rising as each year passes. So that can sound a bit, I don't know, abstract. So I want to give you some concrete examples. One of the causes of depression and anxiety that I write about is disconnection from other people. We are the loneliest society there's ever been. There's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none. There are more people who have nobody to turn to than any other option. We are just behind the Americans in the international league tables of loneliness. And I wanted to understand this better, so I spent a lot of time interviewing an amazing man called Professor John Cassiopo, who's at the University of Chicago. Tragically, he just died. He wasn't an old man. It's a terrible loss. He was the leading expert in the world on loneliness. And, and Professor Cassiopo proved many things. So he showed, for a human being, if you become acutely lonely, that releases as much of the stress hormone cortisol into your bloodstream as if you were punched in the face by a stranger. Being acutely lonely is devastating for your health. It's as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being really quite obese. And I remember asking him, why? Why is being lonely so stressful? And him saying, why do we exist? Right, many reasons. One of them is our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down a lot of the time. They weren't faster than the animals they took down a lot of the time, but they were much better at banding together into groups and cooperating. Just like bees evolved to need a hive, humans evolved to need a tribe. And we are the first humans ever to try to disband our tribes. And if you think about those circumstances where we evolved, if you got cut off from the tribe, you were stressed and flooded with cortisol and anxious for a really good reason, right? You were about to die, you were in terrible danger. 
Those are still the impulses we have as human beings. That's the species we are. That's what we need. And when I learned all this, and of course Professor Cassiopo proved that loneliness causes depression. It's just not, not just a correlation. Of course, depression can also cause loneliness because you retreat. There's a reciprocal relationship. But de he proved that depression causes loneliness. So I was thinking, well, what's the, what's the antidepressant for that, right? What's, if you think about the cow analogy, what's the cow for that problem? Discovered there is one. There's one not very far from where we are. Um, so one of the heroes of my book, Lost Connections, is, is a man called Dr. Sam Everington, who's a doctor in East London, poor part of East London. He's a GP. It's actually where I lived for a long, a long time, though sadly Sam was never my doctor. And Sam was really uncomfortable. He had loads of patients coming to him with terrible depression and anxiety. And he'd been told in medical school, even though he knew the science was much more sophisticated, just tell them they've got a chemical imbalance, that they can't understand more sophisticated stories than that, and just drug them, right? And Sam was really uncomfortable with that. Like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they do have some value, but he could see they weren't solving the problem for a lot of his patients. So he decided to pioneer a different approach. One day, uh, a woman came to him called Lisa Cunningham, who I got to know quite well. Lisa had been shut away in her home with crippling depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to Lisa, don't worry, I'll carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also going to prescribe something else. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was known as Dog Shit Alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like, uh, backed onto a park. He said to Lisa, what I'd like you to do is come and turn up a couple of times a week, meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people. I'm going to turn out and support you and we're going to turn dog shit alley into something nice. The first meeting they had, Lisa was physically sick with anxiety, literally. But a couple of things happened as the group kept on meeting. The first thing was, they discovered they had something to talk about that wasn't how shit they felt, right? Most of the time with depressed and anxious people, we either drug them or we give them a place to talk about their pain and both those things have value. But in this group, they had something completely different. They decided they were gonna learn gardening. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. These were inner city extenders, they didn't know anything about these things, right? Um, they, they, started to get, they started to apply for a gardening qualification. Um, another thing happened. They started to form a tribe. They started to form a group. And they did what human beings do when we form tribes. They started to solve each other's problems. For example, it's an extreme example, there's one guy in the group who'd been thrown out of his home and he was sleeping on the night bus, right? Everyone else in the group was like, of course you're depressed if you're sleeping on the night bus. They started pressuring the local council, Tower Hamlet's council, to get this guy a home. They succeeded, they got him a home. It was the first time they'd done something for someone else in years, it made them feel great. The way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom.